My name is Nikki Dion, and I am the program coordinator for the Métis Community Support Worker Program, uh, which I'll probably call MCSW for the rest of the interview because it's such a mouthful. Um, and my role is to support the students. I advocate on their behalf. I connect them to supports. I help them navigate systems. I also provide some funding support like childcare and uh, gas and grocery uh, support. And I keep their kitchen and pantry filled on campus. <laughs> yeah. Tanase, uh, my name is Colleen Hodson. I'm the Director of Education for Métis Nation BC and I'm a proud citizen of our Métis government in British Columbia. And my role with the CSW program is to work a lot with the instructors and the curriculum and just talk about what that looks like and what the METI pedagogy uh, could be and is throughout the course. So a lot of work with the instructors and a lot of work with Nikki. Before I came on board, uh, the Ministry of Youth and collaboration with some of the other ministries with Métis Nation British Columbia um, conducted a gap analysis. A survey was sent out to uh, Métis citizens and people on the MNBC distribution list um, and basically asked things, you know, your regular demographics questions, um, but also what's the highest level of education you've received. Um, there are a lot of Métis with a lower level of education, and so uh, we wanted to kind of gather some of that information. Uh, and one of the questions that was asked was that um, if you were offered a program, what kind of program would you like? Would you like something in the sciences? Would you? Uh, and the resounding response in general was something in a support role. Uh, mm. A lot of Métis are nurturers and want to help people. So um, they started a discussion with the University of Fraser Valley, who already had an existing community support worker program, and they started to talk about how that could be customized to fit for some Métis students. Well, if we're really talking about time, we can say <laughs> that the relationship with UFE started many years ago. So. Uh, I went to university at UFE, okay. and both my sons went to university at, at UFE, and um, I sit on the Senate Indigenization Committee of the University of Fraser Valley. So in my role there and working with uh, the folks at UFE, uh, there was an opportunity for to build that relationship and to grow it. And so when we were talking about the program and then we were looking at, well, gee, where's a place we could host this cohort and who could be partner with? And you, he came to mind. So the meeting started, the relationship was strengthened and here we are. I don't think the original aim has changed. I think the, the general uh, hope for this program was to provide an educational opportunity um, to, uh, to offer to Métis people, but also to provide them with um, cultural support. Uh, a lot of Métis people, a lot, a lot of Métis people don't find out until later in their lives that they are Métis unless they are lucky enough to practice uh, through family members uh, throughout their lives. And so um, part of what we were hoping for was to help what we call bring them home. And uh, so to offer these cultural experiences to Métis people who maybe have just recently found out that they're Métis, um, as well as providing them with the skills that they need to be successful in uh, higher than minimum wage opportunities. Um, again, because of the low level of education for many Métis in BC. So, um, so that aim hasn't really changed, but the delivery has. And so, um, you know, in bringing these students on board, uh, it was quickly evident that there was a lot of barriers and a lot of skills missing. So one of the things that um, we started to offer were some skill building workshops as well as the in-classroom and as well as cultural workshops. Mm -hmm. So we kind of added some in to enrich their experience, uh, but that aim I don't know. I think it stayed the same. No, I think the aim stayed the same. It was maybe just recognizing the needs and defining yeah. what those needs were mm -hmm. and then responding to that in a way that would help the students. And although they're individuals as a cohort, there were needs that, that there was a commonality such as daycare. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And gas. Yeah. And food. So yeah. these things recognized, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the amount of need, I guess. Yeah. Uh, for each student, so then it could be met because without that, it was going to be difficult for them to focus on the program. Mm -hmm. It's brand new, never been done before, a complete pilot project. Um, we are in semester three of five. Yeah, so we are pretty close to the halfway mark, actually. Yeah, so semester one was uh, summer 2018, and that was an opportunity for upgrading. So all the students, no matter what their level of uh, education um, was coming into the program, were put into upgrading, and um, so that those that perhaps only had a grade eight level of education were able to come up to the standards required for university and to help those that maybe had that to brush up and remind mm -hmm. themselves also what it's like to be in school. And then um, the fall semester last year, they started their foundational courses, the kind of getting ready for university courses. And then now they are in the thick of the community support worker courses. Uh, they do that for this semester and then summer 2019. And then in fall 2019, they will do a practicum uh, in a community support worker role, and then they're done. Oh. Yeah, so the finish line is at the end of December this year, convocation June 2020. It's very hard to measure this program. One, because there's no previous measurements to kind of fall back on, and two, because, yeah, like how do you define a success? Um, so one of the things that me and our uh, uh, policy analyst and, and the individual that is on my team that's really, really good with evaluation and reporting, we talked a lot about it. And so what we ended up coming up with is um, we do have like a tangible, uh, quanti like quantifiable evaluation that's conducted at the end of every semester. And in that, we ask, you know, please rate your uh, overall health in a number of different areas over the semester, financial, relational, cultural, mental, physical, uh, and rate your overall satisfaction. Can you tell us what workshops were most meaningful for you, all in a ranking system? But I also have uh, experience being a community support worker myself, and so I know the importance of having that person-to-person uh, -person interaction. So every semester, I also sit down with the students and have uh, an informal check-in. Uh, and so I have a list of questions that they get beforehand. And so I ask them things like, you know, how are things going? What areas do you need support? What areas are going well? What can we do to make that better? That kind of stuff. Um, so I think that in, in the end of it, we'll see success as here was the baseline when they came into the program and where was the improvement? And then also there's the regular educational based success markers like grades, graduation, student retention. Um, so I think that that's how we're gonna know if it's successful, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a moving target. And their, their interest and um, in cultural and, yeah. and Métis culture like so, everything everything about it, whether it's language or clothing or food or or uh, everything, they're, they're, they seem to be really they're reaching out. Oh, so that's that's grown from yeah. the beginning because they're feeling a little bit more comfortable with who they are. Mm -hmm. So now they're wanting to know more, and they know that it's uh, they can share that with their families. I'm sure when they go home. Yes. So it's it's kind of yeah. Well, and even just like through discussion with them, because I also interact with them quite regularly uh, but the yeah the level of interest in being involved at the community level mm -hmm. we've had quite a few now who are very involved with their uh, charter community in their in their town or wherever they live um, but yeah and also the involvement of children and you know uh, offering these opportunities to their kids as well because they may might not have had them so that was yeah. Yeah. So it's really that community, the community supporting them and their families supporting yeah. them. And that's not typical no. that you would see in a program or have those expectations. Mm -hmm. no. So that's really different and it's really growing. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. I, I think it's fantastic. So, um, and for me as a program coordinator in terms of having an impact, 
I think that if someone learns something about themselves, that's an impact, mm-hmm. right? From the, you know, unfortunately we have had students leave the program, but it just means that their journey isn't in within lines with this program at this time. But if, if having been accepted into the program began a journey of healing that was necessary for whatever else was in life, then I think that's a positive impact. So, mm-hmm. um, but still, how is it? How do you measure those things, right? How do you <laughs> how do you measure human emotions and <laughs> right? So interesting. I'll just share an experience that we had with the instructors here when we started working on that exact thing. So right at the very beginning, when they were doing their first semester, we thought, okay. So I met with the instructors and that and we had meetings and we sat there and we shared lots of resources and curriculum, specifically METI. And uh, many of my own resources and resources that I've developed over the years working for MNBC. So we shared those resources and talked about them. And the first thing I recognized right away is the instructors were somewhat reluctant to jump into this and engage in it. And the reason why was, of course, they were familiar with it. It wasn't their area of expertise in teaching or sharing. So once they realized that we could do this together, and as we moved along, just do it piece by piece by piece, and that there was no real wrong way to do it, which they absolutely thought there was. But once we understood that everybody has a different level of knowledge about it, like everybody and, and everything. So, and once we had that conversation and, and discussion, it just changed. They were so open and yeah. so willing to engage in it and to take resources that were there and develop lesson plans around them and had all these creative and amazing ideas of ways to do it. So it wasn't about me sitting down with them going, this is how you need to do it. Here are the resources. This is what it looks like. It was me sharing the resources with them and going, what do you guys think? And recognizing that they had all different areas of expertise in the resources and the stuff they come up with was was truly amazing. It was awesome. So, and then watching them build on that and do it, and then every time uh, there was an opportunity to introduce more resources or ideas, uh, whether it was math or English or whatever, it was, uh, I got lots of ideas from them. (laughs) So it was amazing, but I guess what was most uh, uh, meaningful was their willingness, their willingness to invest in it. Mm -hmm. So they were coming from a good place. And the students know that, of course, right? Through the, and it's their culture. So here we have people that are not Métis teaching this and sharing this, but it works. So I would say that the pedagogical process is still happening. I don't think there's anything that can be determined or definitive about that. I think it needs to happen in the classroom with the students and with the instructors, whether they're Métis or not Métis, or the people around them, like Shirley being a really strong First Nations woman and sharing her culture with them yeah. and, and that. So I think it's more than one thing. Um, so, But the process itself has to be collaborative. So no one person can own anything. And so the pedagogy of it is that this is our way of knowing, this is our way of being, and this is, so I, an example I would use, and I always go to my elders with this sort of work, is that uh, one of my elders uh, explains it this way, when when there's these issues over what language we speak as Métis, people will say Mitch of Cree, or there's more French in it, or it's all Cree. And I mean, I grew up with Cree and I'm Métis, but I know other people that grew up with speak just Mitch of. So I asked her, so I said, so how, how do we determine that? And she goes, well, I just tell everybody, this is just my language, it's just mine. It doesn't mean you have to have it, but I'm just telling you that it's my language and, and I just want to plant the seeds for you so that you can explore what that looks like. And that was a great way to talk about pedagogy. And that's what it is in the classroom, it's just planting those seeds. They're young Métis people in different parts of their life and different parts of their journey and where are they gonna go with it? It's not to be determined by anybody, but their, their own selves. So we can only do that and support them they're going to end up in amazing places. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, bringing that Métis uh, information and culture into the curriculum, absolutely sharing Métis poems and, you know, mm-hmm. how do you uh, use math to build your Red River card yeah. or whatever, absolutely. right? Um, for sure. But one of the really incredible parts of this program is that um, 
built right in from the get-go at least once a month, um, oh no, sorry, twice a month, bi-weekly, we'll offer a cultural workshop to the students. And that's a big portion of what I do, is coordinating those days. And that includes reaching out to and getting, uh, securing the Métis elders to come in or the uh, knowledge keepers and the artisans to share their knowledge, to share their perspective also. Because like Colleen said, uh, Métis people are so different and so it, it's really good for these students to get a multitude of perspectives mm -hmm. to really learn that like it, everyone is so different, but there's still a lot that is the same. Yeah, they're <laughs> and, for sure. Exactly, yeah. right? So um, yeah, and those workshops are just amazing. And uh, we bring in, we cover costs for supplies. We bring in these knowledge keepers. And so they've done all kinds of stuff. They've had a, a day of beading with a Métis artisan. They had uh, uh, jigging and medicines with a knowledge keeper. They've, um, they'll be making capotes in the future, uh, learning machif and Cree, uh, hopefully going on a canoe journey, like just a number of different things. Um, <clears throat> that are in these workshops. And also, they have a uh, Métis elder dedicated to the program. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah, like UFE has this really cool program of having elders available for students to access uh, during uh, lots of different times of the day. And uh, we worked together to not just bring on more and more Métis elders, but that we have one that specifically focuses on these students and spends a lot of time with them. And I think that's a huge way sure, yeah, of absolutely. us. So, yeah. It's, and, and they're invited to community events. They're invited to MNBC events. They've come out and, and lent their experience and perspective to surveys and research and... Uh, you know, all these different things. So they're also participating in that way. Yeah, and I think the, the part that's really important there too is this connection to the community that this creates. Yeah. So if you're bringing Lisa Shepard in, who's an amazing Métis artisan, into the classroom and they're doing beading, or you're bringing Marie Berset, the elder that's there for them, or they're carving paddles with Patrick, when they're doing these things, Patrick and, and uh, Lisa and, and everybody else are still out in the community. So now they leave and they go to the community and they see these people that were at the university. Yeah. So they're making this connection that this is the, the university is a community, the classroom is a community, and the Métis community. And it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, from my own lived experience, that was never like that. You were very disconnected. I had my Métis community and I had the university and they were separate. You went to school and you went and did stuff in your Métis community. So now it's changing. It's all being part of the community. So I think that's just so key. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 